All right, welcome to the podcast. We're back with Cake Spot. It's been two years in the making. Thanks for coming back. Your whole lives have changed. Last time you were here, I think you were at a million dollars a year going viral on TikTok. Since then, you've been on Shark Tank. You're a totally different business. You guys have an office here in California. Walk us through what's going on. We blacked out, so we can't <laughs> tell you. <laughs> it, feel, it must feel like that a little bit. Yeah, so... In the last two years, we've grown from a million dollar a year company to a hundred million dollar a year company. It's unbelievable. Had babies, and we really don't know what happened. No, <laughs> it's really been based off this core product. So we sell cakes, yep, covers, the nipple covers for people who don't know. Yeah, yep. they're the internet's favorite nipple covers. Um, and we have been really building our business on this core line and experimenting with other products at the same time and we kind of have identified this bigger purpose around how do we own the boob solution space and we always say how do we do what Spanx did for butts but for boobs and we feel like we're just getting started so I don't know where to go from here but yeah well let's start with this so at some point you guys are doing well enough and does Shark Tank approach you or do you guys apply so we actually were talking to Shark Tank we applied after three months in business we got through the process really to like the last step where we would start working with producers. But this was like three months into our business. And as like a new entrepreneur who's just starting their business, you think it's like the dream to be on Shark Tank and get your brand out there and get that bump. And I remember Taylor calling me and being like, I don't want to do it. We're not ready. They're going to tear apart our business. It's going to look terrible. And I was at the time, you know, we had a conversation about that. And that seems like a crazy thing to say no to an opportunity like that. And that's something I'm really passionate about, though, is like knowing when to say no, but we can maybe go back to that. But so we said no, and I'm so glad we did. We didn't have the infrastructure at all to even support going on the show. Fulfilling we had like things. a product idea. We didn't have a sure, scalable you, path you to grow. Yet. Yeah. So it we would, didn't have much to share. We didn't have much to show. And the nature of our business being at the time we were truly a nipple cover brand. We had three right. products in our line. They were all nipple covers. We we're like, this could be laughable. Our business could be laughable. It could be made into a joke when we were identifying there's much deeper mission and a deeper purpose behind this, and we don't want it to get lost. So we said no. A year later, we were like, you know. So 2023. In 2023, our business was in a place where we actually had a scalable, efficient strategy to continue growing our business and the infrastructure to support it. So we applied again. We got on and ended up doing a deal with Emma Greed, who was like our dream investor. She's the co-founder of Skims. Did you guys Skims. know she was going to be on prior? Because she's not usually there, no. so you had a little bit of a guest shark. No, the crazy thing is Casey and I went on our first company retreat. It was the two of us because <laughs> we were the only people at the company. <laughs> and we wrote down a list of manifestations that, I mean, some may call them business goals, but they were manifestations. They okay. seemed so outlandish. It yeah. was like, we want to do $100 million in sales. We want to donate a million dollars to women's health causes. We want to become a household name, and we want Emma Greed to be our investor. So you, wow. So you, you had this written down. That's incredible. And But we didn't know, how are we going to even like be in the same room as sure. Emma Greed? Like, like we don't run in the same circles as Emma, if you can imagine. So like, we didn't think there was a day where we'd even be in the same vicinity. Yeah. So we said when we started the Shark Tank process, we're like, if there's any chance Emma's coming back, if you can pair us up with her. So you asked them. Mm-hmm. You asked the producers. And wow. they said, we don't know. And we found out a week before we went on air that, that she, she was going to be a guest. And it really leveled up the whole experience. We so went do from- you guys then get more nervous? Do you guys get more prep? Do you guys start changing things up as it relates to like what you're going to say on stage? Mm-hmm. I I don't even... Because that's a whole other level. (laughs) Well, it was... It almost went from us going going on the show to get our brand out there, reach a new audience, gain a a little bit of credibility to now, like, we are going to do whatever it takes to make Emma think we have a viable business that she wants to invest in and see and seize our vision and our our path to growth I and love the humility of that statement think yeah. we have a good business yeah. I wanted to think we do I mean at the time we like started seeing seeing some traction in in that we did and we were able to communicate that so and whose idea was it to put uh, the nipple cover on Mr. Wonderful's head? Because that that's was pretty idea. bold. That was my idea. So we put a nipple cover on Mr. Wonderful's head to did, show did that. You, did you think he would have maybe said, no, don't yeah. do this? And we didn't know if it was going to work because cakes oh. are grippy, not sticky. So we do recommend them under <laughs> snug tops. Disclaimer, everyone. Okay. And we actually made our dad test it okay. because my dad. Your dad's also bald? Well, he's. 
would probably be offended if I said that, but he's, he's, <laughs> he shaves his head yes. on his own accord. So he has a gorgeous <laughs> head. Um, and we texted my stepmom cause she has cakes obviously. And we're like, can you put a cake on dad's head and see if it sticks? And they sent a picture back, worked perfectly. And we actually didn't want a script in the, the thing about Shark Tank is like they make you script everything into the pitch. The whole Q&A is like off the cuff. Sure. The whole pitch, the pitch is, is like scripted. very well scripted so they can get the right camera angles. Yeah. And I kind of tossed it out to the producers like we we want this like funny off the cuff moment and invite Mr. Wonderful up. And they made us script it in. So I was like, OK, I felt pretty confident that he wasn't going to like completely shut us down okay, if good. they felt good and about it. He ended it. up wanting to do a deal, which was the funniest part because he I did, don't know. Yeah. I don't know that he... By the way, I loved his offer. The royalty deal is smart. He would have 3X'd his money. Yeah. Really interesting. It was a good deal for him. It was a good deal for him. Yeah. He's so funny with the royalties. Yeah, Mr. Royalties. But yeah, and so then at some point, Emma gives you an offer. And what are are you guys thinking like, oh my God, it's happening? Yeah. 20 minutes in, we're doing the Q&A. Like you have a lot of Shark Tank businesses on. So most people who are listening probably know this. But like your Q&A could be 20 minutes. It could be two hours. 20 minutes in. Emma goes in with the deal and it's like off the bat, it's within the same striking zone as something we would accept. Cause you also like, we had to go in with a strategy of like, this is the ceiling and this is the floor of like a deal that we would accept because you don't really have time to discuss live. So like we had to know we were going to be on the same page of the negotiation so that as soon as she threw out her first deal, I think both of us in our head were like, 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 yes, like just because it was close enough that and then we we had discussed a few strategies of, OK, if she says this, we'll go back with that. And we were close enough. So it just felt so surreal because it became really real when we walked out there. Like, A, they could tear you apart. You're putting yourself in a very vulnerable situation. They could hate your product, hate you, like hate whatever, just be having a bad day and want to get <laughs> it over with. So that's true. The moment that she put out her initial offer, I just felt a sense of relief. I'm like... Like, we got through this. We didn't get totally we, humiliated. <laughs> we didn't get annihilated. Like, And our dream investor is somewhat interested in it. And it was just so validating. It's like this person who we really look up to finds our business interesting. And she fought for you. She, yeah. like told, she was like pitching herself to you. Yeah, it was like kind of a funny balance because that is not a typical totally. investor pitch where you're like, I don't want to offend any of these people <laughs> and I want to hear them out, but I also don't want to lose this other investor that's our dream investor. So it was like that I found the hardest part is like just like navigating the personalities in that weird setting. Well, and the producers make it really clear ahead of time and for yourself, like you want to hear out every deal. We knew going into it, we want to deal with Emma. That was very clear from the beginning. And then Mark And Emma have this funny banter where he's basically egging her on, like almost saying, if these guys aren't serious about doing a deal with you, you need to pull your offer. And then it was just like, okay, tunnel vision. We want to deal with Emma. We're going to get it done. And within 10 minutes, we had landed on a deal with Emma, had to pass on the royalty offer from Mr. Wonderful. But it was it was really we were like, we couldn't speak the rest of the it was day. Very, I was going to say, like, give the listeners a window. So you leave the room. You're, in this case, your <laughs> dream, the thing that you had manifested years ago mm-hmm. is now happened. It probably feels like a dream. Mm-hmm. And you, and what happens? You guys walk out of the room. What we do you do? We walk out. We like, I thought we would be like celebrating, wanting to go out for drinks. Like we did not speak. Like it's, You were in shock. It's almost, um, I would say, equivalent to playing like, if you're an athlete playing like a really important like play, I don't watch sports, a playoff game or like a championship, okay. like, you're just so focused on doing a good job, like getting the points across. I feel like we just like had so much like, and then you're preparing all day. So like, I feel like we just like after that and we knew we got through it and we knew it, we did a good job. Like we were just like, it was actually a really hard thing to process when you have this big goal that you don't know how you're going to even achieve it. And then it happens. And then you think it's going to feel one way, but you're just honestly like so overwhelmed. So we, we took a few days to process it. And then we really like got to working on our deal with Emma and started meeting with her. And, and how long did like that take part. the due diligence of the deal? It took a few months, I would say. Okay. It took six months. Six months. So are you guys like, oh my God, it's falling apart. That's a no, long time. No, no, no. no. Okay. I didn't feel that way. I just know she's so busy. But if I can <laughs> okay. just go back to how we felt. So I made, we're super into manifesting. 
I feel like people are going to tune out after I say that. But I made Casey walk into the green room before we went on air and act like we just got to deal with Emma. I was like, I want you to walk into this room and we're going to celebrate. We just got to deal with Emma. So we hadn't gone on yet. We walked wow. in and out of the green room and we're celebrating. We're, we're like high-fiving. We're like, like yeah, like we just got to deal with Emma. And then we had to like go through that exercise to like truly like experience the emotions of this is what it's going to feel like. And I think putting ourselves in that mindset when we went out there of like it's going to happen, like we already know what it's going to feel like. Granted, it felt completely different. <laughs> Casey said sure. we were complete like mutes after it. Craig, my husband actually asked, he's like, are you okay? Like, are you sick? I was like, I just like can't speak. But I think going through that process of really experiencing the emotions ahead of time so you feel confident and worthy and like I like just kind of at ease with the whole experience. So where did you just go? Let's go into the weeds. Where did you pick up that skill? Like, because it's <laughs> probably so it on a so podcast. the people there's are, there are people who say manifesting is not real. Yeah, yeah. We've, I've had uh, psychologists say that yeah. here on the podcast, but I think there's another part of it where it's like, you're setting a target. And so where did mm. this come from for you and why do you continue to do it? Cause it's working. So the, yeah. to the person who's like, I want to do that. Yeah, yeah. What is your advice to them? Well, I always laugh. Taylor called me one time and she goes, I just had a really intense manifestation. I started crying. <laughs> so Taylor's really big into it. But like, I would say in a way that maybe more people can relate to, like what it, what it means in a more tactful sense is like, it's really like setting a target for where you want to go. And I am very passionate that like, this is what sets a successful entrepreneur up from not whatever that means to you. It's like, if you achieve what you're setting out to do versus not, it's like based on really having a vision of where you want to go. And you don't even really need to like know how you're going to get there, but you need to like set out for what you're going to do. And that's something we've done from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Before we even started our business, we said three things. We want to be a $150 million a year brand. We want to donate a million dollars to charity and we want to be a household name. Three things. Mm -hmm. And we had this vision and that allowed us that guided all of our decisions and continues to guide all of our decisions and like really forces us to say no. Like I think of our first year, there were a lot of good opportunities that came up that we said no to because ultimately it would have been a distraction from our longer term vision. And that's like the most powerful piece is like you need to define what you even want. And it might not be to be a $150 million a year brand. It might be, I really want to be able to stay home with my kids and mm -hmm. building out this, you know, making decisions along the way to allow you to do that. I had a, as Casey said, a powerful manifestation exercise that made me cry. No, I have a lot of them. But when I was working my full-time job in Boston, we had just moved to Connecticut. So I was commuting once a week. I'd commute on a Monday morning, and I'd come back on a Wednesday every week from Connecticut to Boston. And we hadn't started cakes, and I would get a Starbucks and close my eyes and smell the coffee and picture myself on the way to Boston for an investor meeting for my own company. And I was like, I don't know what my company is, but that's, the, that's why I believe in manifestation is because you don't need to know. It takes the pressure off of knowing exactly how you're going to get there in that moment. And it allows you to dream bigger than you would if you had to figure out all the logistics of how it's going to work out. So I would just like really like take in all of the senses. Like, how does this feel? Like, how does this smell? Like, what is this like? What are the emotions going through my body? And the other day we were on our way to a meeting with Emma. And then we had the chance to meet with the CEO of Third Love in the same trip. So two icons of major major undergarment brands and I just remember I had deja vu I'm like this is exactly the feeling that I had five years ago on my commute my ridiculous commute to my corporate job wishing I had some path and I didn't know the path but like I'm like oh I felt this before so in that moment do you feel nothing because you've already been there yeah like like it you're takes like the I knew it. Excitement away. A little bit out of it because yeah. you're not as starstruck. It kind of like normalizes the situation when totally. you're in it. I have this in real estate development because it lives in my head before even I have the land. And then when I have grand the grand opening, 
and I'll be like really specific as I'll be walking by. So in this case with the sports bar, let's say, let's say I'm, I have a vision where it's like, I'm going to be saying hello to Mark Cuban as I walk by being like, thank you for joining the investment mm -hmm. team. That'll happen. And I won't feel anything. Yeah. I'll be bored. Yeah. It's, it's this weird thing. Well, we found that a lot with different, different things along the way. I don't know if you've experienced this where the most exciting part has been almost like the little steps along the way where you realize, oh, we're doing it. And it might be our like the first time we went viral in quotes where we sold a few hundred units in a day. Now we're selling 50 to 100,000 units a day. And we sell a pair of cakes every five seconds, I think the stat is now. And But I think back to the first time that we went viral, in quotes, if you're listening, um, where we sold maybe a few hundred units in a day. And like that was almost more exciting because we didn't think we could, or we didn't, we hadn't done it before. So it was the first time we experienced mm -hmm. that level of success. So it was those little moments along the way, or the first time we got in like a major publication in Vogue or something like that. Like mm -hmm. we realized, oh my God, we did it. And then you do a little bit get, get desensitized. So I think just with that, it's been really important to just like really enjoy the process and not be so focused on like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, this big outcome at the end, because it's like those little things along the way that mm -hmm. really are the exciting part. When it came to Shark Tank and you guys aired, what did you see bump wise as a business? We had been reaching so many people on social media. So we did about the same um, volume of orders that we did during our Black Friday. So it was definitely okay. like a good weekend. So it was like the best day. Maybe you just yeah. repeated yeah. like a, a really good yeah. day of the year. Okay. So not, not crazy. But if you, th not, not crazy for us, because if you think about it, like the show reaches maybe 2 million people when it airs I think was the number but we reach more than that probably on social media every day so I think if you're not reaching so many people on social media businesses do see like an insane but the uh, content we get from Shark Tank is so important in terms of like credibility building and then we've generated way more revenue from the ads featuring our Shark Tank content than we have from the show Got it. So that's super so cool when you think, yeah, yeah, when you think about leveraging the opportunity. I mean, we're still a year later totally. running the same <laughs> ads featuring us slapping the cake on, Mar on um, Mr. Wonderful's head. So yeah, it's like smart. the value you get. Did you it. see in the, just in the marketplace, did you see your competitors shift their strategy all of a sudden? Because now in some way you've given them credibility in their product and maybe mm. now they're going to throw marketing dollars because they're an established brand. Like what did you see the response from other brands in your space? We definitely have a knockoff issue now. So there's like a counterfeit knockoff issue. A lot of brands, especially our size, like I think Shark Tank brands specifically, but like where you're not big enough to have like the legal force to like take them all down, but you're big enough where they're starting to see there's traction. So that's like been a huge challenge after Shark Tank is like managing the knockoff counterfeit situation. Like they'll, they'll do your branding, all of it. Yeah, like they'll Fake steal, store, they'll essentially. steal okay. our content. So they'll take videos of our team, wow. me, Lexi, whatever, and then drive it to a website that, again, steals our content. So they think they're on the Cakes page, but then you'll realize, oh, it's the URL is some wonky thing. Got it. Yeah, so that's been a challenge. And then the competitors were not too worried about like other boob, well, we're, we call it boob solution space. We don't really worry about competitors typically just because like I don't actually think anyone really should. I think if you have your own core vision of where you're going, which we do to disrupt the bra industry and provide solutions that fit women how they're dressing today as like a complement to a bra or an alternative to a bra. And we say like to summarize that we want to do what Spanx did did for butts but for boobs so when we think about that like we are on our path and there are other brands that sell similar products who they've maybe like tried to mimic a little bit of our marketing but like that doesn't necessarily worry me and I don't think it's really working for them because they need to stay core to their brand and they have their own things that they're doing well and you know they should just lean into that so when you guys first started working with Emma was it immediately other SKUs other products how big did she see your brand because that's always a thing right you mm -hmm. have this experienced veteran and they're going to tell you things that you probably didn't have any mm -hmm. concept of and so how big was she thinking when you first started working with her she like really from the beginning has believed in the future of this becoming a billion dollar brand. She sees so much opportunity and she's been laser focused on us staying focused in the boob solution space. I think at the time we aired, we were like, oh, we could go into apparel that 
complements the boobs, that we could do these more solutions like the core cakes covers products, push up, lift, volume, all those things. And she's been laser focused on helping us build out the solution space because there is not an owner in that category. It's like a lot of like cheap Amazon brands or like lower tier stuff you might get at CVS or something like that. So um, she's seen the vision really clearly from the beginning. And then she hasn't pushed us at all on developing a robust product line too quickly. And I think that's been really helpful because we're completely aligned on that. Like I think the reason for our success is we've been so laser focused. We've built this business off of pretty much nine SKUs that we've had for two years. Like we're not constantly coming out with newness. It's like how do we get really smart about marketing the same product to every single different use case? So instead of having 10 products and marketing them to 10 different types of people, we have one product and we're marketing it 10 different ways. But I think that's been helpful because also the businesses she comes from, they do have a lot of newness, like Skims and Good American, right, they have their product to. lines, their categories that they're expanding into. It's like such an impressive beast of a business. And it's been actually really reassuring to have her say, no, your secret sauce is in staying and focused. Just keep you focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so as you guys, how's your life changed? What's, what's, since two years ago, and then since the show, here you have a $100 million business. I mean, like, everybody that I know that has a $100 million business, which isn't many people, but I always tell them, like, do you want to just make yourself the chairwoman or the mm -hmm. chairman and, you know, let someone else run the company? Because it's different. Yeah, yeah. It's different now. You have different problems. Mm -hmm. You have an office. You got a yeah. team to lead. And so how do you guys view that? Well, just to set the stage, like, just for – so two years ago – I had just quit my corporate job. Casey had quit a few months earlier. We were doing about a million dollars a year in sales. So so that's just, just to level set like the transition. Yeah, and I think like I always say our job at its core has been the same. I'm very simple, like three things. Like I can't handle more than three things. Our job has been the same three things from the time we started to now. And it looks a little different, but it's... It's the same. It's having a vision. No one else can have the vision. We could hire the most qualified people in every area, but no one besides us has the vision. We need to say no to things that are a distraction from that vision, and we need to hire the best possible people in any areas that we need them to. And that was true for our first hire, and that's true now when we have like more complexity in our organization. I think the difference is now it's a bigger beast to manage. So now things are coming up that we... I don't even know. Like, it's just like every – things that might have felt small before are feeling a lot bigger. Like, for example, our manufacturing capacity. Like, we are having to onboard additional manufacturers, fulfillment centers, and then, of course, having additional team members on our team to manage those things. So it's it's a lot of, like, infrastructure and, like, HR responsibilities and then managing, you know, making sure our team feels really secure. So that's been much more challenging, but I – I think there is definitely a need for us to take a step back so we can continue leading the vision and have the most capable people really running the operation who have done it before because ultimately like we haven't done this before. I would just add to that. I have like a personal way I've changed, not to just talk about me, but when you have little problems at the beginning of your business that seem so big, appreciate those because those are going to be 10 times bigger down the line. So I think just like for anyone listening who's in like the earlier stage of your business versus where you want to go, like when things come up, they're going to come up at some point. Like those problems are going to just be 10 times more annoying to deal with <laughs> later on. But the good news is, and something that I find a lot of peace in now is like as much as it's harder to run a hundred million dollar company in some ways, you also have really qualified people leading each department. So I actually sleep pretty well at night knowing, I mean, we had a huge customer service issue, which pains us because we care so much about customer service. But I slept fine at night because I knew we had a really strong person at the head of our customer service team who's going to figure it out and fix it. So versus like when it was just us, it would be like me on the phone crying to like customers <laughs> and like the post office and our fulfillment center. So, so that makes me feel happy knowing like, I mean, that's just like one of my core principles is just getting like the best people in every spot. I'm not going to speak for you. I'll just, how I've changed in the last two years, like three years ago, 
we were both on the verge of layoffs, couldn't get a promotion in our marketing jobs. Today, we have the most viral product on TikTok. And it's so validating and it's a testament to even when someone else doesn't believe in you, you need to believe in yourself more. So like even when your boss doesn't believe in you or you go into an investor meeting and someone shuts you out, you are going to get yourself where you want to go even when no one else sees the vision. So I just think it's like a testament to how much can change in two years, how much if you let yourself really have great ambition and like let yourself actually define it. define what your greatest ambition is. Don't limit that because you don't know how you're going to get there. So that has been just like such a confidence building thing for me. I'm like I used to go into meetings in my corporate job and feel like I don't really know. I feel like I know what I'm talking about. I feel like I have value to add, but like I don't know if like I should be speaking up in this situation or I like go into these like meetings with like CEO type people and be like, oh, I should like stay back because I don't really have a lot to contribute. And so I just think like I could go on with all these like, you know, everyone has gone through this. You've been you haven't gotten jobs that you've applied for, whatever. And it's like you have so much to offer. And just like if you can let yourself dream big and have great ambition, you will get there. Does it ever scare you in the sense of like, oh my God, here it is. Like the moment you realize the thing that you've had in your mm. head is going to happen, there's a part of you that probably is terrified like, oh my God, I am that person. And I lived in my head for X amount of time mm -hmm. thinking I was, but I did I really believe I was? Mm -hmm. And now clearly I am. <laughs> so I, it's think like, you, I feel like a little bit like, is the shoe going to drop? And okay. so okay. I'm yeah. like holding on to thing. it really tight. Okay. So that's what I would say is the biggest fear. But I also think I feel very clear on the fulfillment I get out of doing this is the greatest gift of it all. So I'm like, I'm not going to get distracted by other outside like points of validation. I'm like, if I can get the fulfillment out of this, like no matter what happens in life next, I'm like always going to be seeking this level of like excitement and fulfillment out of my job. Let's talk about what's next for you guys. Where do you guys see this going ultimately? So oh, you're on God. a hell of a run. <laughs> I would say the economy just at a macro level is going to get better. And so that's good news. Positive. I don't know if that means more cakes or not, but nonetheless, it means it's a good news. And so directionally, things are favorable. How big do you want to take it? Do you want to sell it? I think well, what's great is our vision has stayed the same from the beginning as we have ambitions to redefine the bra industry and like really solve problems that women are facing. Even for us, like we started this business because we hated the pads in our sports bras. That's a relatively simple problem. But we have heard from women who have gone through breast cancer, breastfeeding moms, like all sorts of different, much more serious things and much more complicated problems to fix. So that's the first thing is defining and the first thing is designing more solutions for different problems that people are facing. That is a big mission that we have. Like I always say, like people have somehow sent people to the moon, but we still haven't really cracked the code on like supporting women's boobs and <laughs> like providing these solutions. So there's a lot more from like a product standpoint that we are on a mission to do. There's no doubt this is multi-billion dollar opportunity to do this mm -hmm. and Cakes is going to get there. I think as founders, we are at the point where like we want to be able to continue getting the team in the right direction, making sure the ethos of the brand stays true, and then really hiring some more people to be running the business to this next stage of growth because there's a lot of complexity to continue growing at the rate that we are. That needs to happen. That Not to say we couldn't do it. I think we could figure it out, but like we want people who have done it before, who are experts in, you know, expanding internationally, expanding our product line, adding in wholesale retail, really taking the brand there. Are you guys international now? No. No. There's so wow. many. We're, our, all an, of our okay. growth has completely come from direct to consumer in the U.S. So that's the exciting thing. There's so much opportunity. It's huge. Growth lovers we haven't even touched. So it's on deck. Give people a window into 2025 the, at the end of this year. 2025 is the year of lift. So we the are. The year of lift and the year of infrastructure. <laughs> okay. Casey's not an operation. Yeah. So Casey is also calling it the year of infrastructure. We like to have one defining 
mantra for the year. So like 2023 was the year of diversifying our revenue. Very exciting. This was the year of product testing. Next year, we're nailing Lyft. So boob lift yeah, like, yeah. and support like I i'm not, like not business right. lift yeah um so really nailing a support solution that women can wear without without bras, a bra because that's the biggest challenge like in wow. tricky necklines and tops like there are all these chicken cutlet things and sticky bras and all this stuff but for people who really need lift and support they're not cutting it at all so it seems like gravity's going against you but gravity you have is, you have a plan we have a plan we have so many great, never been done before, lift solutions wow. in development now. We're so excited about it. It's going to be so groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> but that, and I mean, that we're super excited about. I would just say like, Mark Cuban gave us the advice on Shark Tank. He's like, you really should listen to your customers. And we're like, we really should. And the comments we get all the time are people love their cakes, but they want to be able to wear them without a bra because they need lifts. Like most people in our country are double D or larger boobs. That's the average bra size. In Is the that right? So yeah. Whoa. So it's really important to be able to provide a supportive solution. Yeah. Anyways, I, I could keep going, but the Understood. So when you think about manifesting now, like, who's your next Emma Greed? Like, who is the person that you think about a dream collab with? Maybe someone you launched the Lyft with. You know, is it Elon well, Musk? I mean, how funny would that be? We're launching Lyft <laughs> with Elon. That's hilarious. What a play on <laughs> interesting things. We're going That'd to the moon. That'd be a great marketing play. Elon? Cause. Elon. I mean, there's so many people in the aerospace industry. <laughs> yeah. I think of the iconic players in the industry. Skims. Yeah. Victoria's Secret. Sarah Blakely. Sarah obviously. Blakely from Spanx. I think about, like taking what they've built in being like a defining player in the industry and like putting our spin on what they've been doing and like figuring out how to leverage really like what's going on in society today and what we're building and our vision with someone who is also an icon of of their time and of like a tradition more like a traditional player I haven't, I haven't like fully manifested, so I don't know. I need to like think about that We need more, to do but... some journaling after this. But <laughs> the cool thing is we're looking at this as a new category, similar to how when Spanx came out, it was a new category for shapewear. They defined a category and then were the leading player in it. When Skims came out, they were the leading player in this whole new way of dressing. Like, right. and, and everyone followed. Victoria's Secret, same thing. So like I kind of think... How we are looking at our business is it's not competing at all with any of those brands. It's complementing the way that they are inspiring people to dress. So I don't know what that looks like. Again, we will need to journal and get back to you on the next time we come. The year of lift is coming. The year, year of lift. 2025. So good. Thanks for coming on the podcast, guys. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.